So now we're going to take some of the stuff that we've learned about the brain and behavior and uh, hominid evolution to the next level. So because all animal species are related, so too must their brains. And if they are related and animal species are related, then studying the brains of other animals can also shed life on how our own brains function. Because all species of animals are related, so too must their behavior. And again, so if we study the behavior of other animals, then this can give us insight into our own behavior because it can be really hard to parcel out in our very complex environment the role of particular behaviors and how essential they are. So if we look at animals that have uh, more rudimentary uh, behavior or social structures, then while even though that behavior or the social structures may be more rudimentary, they can still shed some really critical light on the role of those particular behaviors in our own social structure or social hierarchies. And we can study and understand human behavior and brain function by comparing the genes and, and brains and behaviors of different animals. So this builds on points one and two. So this is really why people still engage in animal research. Most animal research is not for uh, um, impact of cosmetics on bunnies. Most, the vast, vast majority of animal research is to look at aspects of the brain and behavior link, looking at the role of particular genes so that we can understand these, the impact of genes and the relationship between brain and behavior in these other animals to inform ourselves. And also because those animals might be particularly important for our own survival, the survival of the species and the balance of um, the ecology that we may try to maintain on earth. So now to give you an idea of looking at human versus animal behavior, um, we're going to show you a couple videos and I want you guys to think about what types of behavior is human and what types of behavior is animal. And typically in class, I would actually ask people to say like, okay, and I would actually ask the class and people would give some examples. Well, what types of behavior are human and what types of behavior are animal? So I want you to take a moment to think about that. What are the types of behavior that you consider uniquely human? And what are the types of behavior that you consider uniquely animal or more specifically non-human? So just take a moment and jot down one or two ideas, okay? What we did is we put two capuchin monkeys side by side and if you give both of them cucumber for the task, the two monkeys side by side, they're perfectly willing to do this 25 times in a row. If you give them grapes, it's a far better food uh, then you create inequity between them. So she gives a rock to us, that's the task, and we give her a piece of cucumber and she eats it. The other one needs to give a rock to us, and that's what she does. And she gets a grape, and she eats it. The other one sees that. She gives a rock to us now, gets again cucumber. She tests the rock now against the wall. She needs to give it to us. And she gets cucumber again. So this is basically the Wall Street protest that you see here. Let me tell you, I, st I still have two minutes left. Let me tell you a funny story about this. this. This study became very famous and we got a lot of comments, especially anthropologists, economists, uh, philosophers. They didn't like this at all because they had decided in their mind, I believe, that, um, that, that uh, uh, fairness is a very complex issue and that animals cannot have it. And so one philosopher even wrote us that it was impossible that monkeys had a sense of fairness because fairness was invented during the French Revolution. So, now, 
And, and another one wrote a whole chapter saying that uh, he would believe it had something to do with fairness if the one who got grapes would refuse the grapes. Now, the funny thing is that Sarah Brosnan, who's been doing this with chimpanzees, had a, a couple of combinations of chimpanzees where, indeed, the one who would get the grape would refuse the grape until the other guy also got a grape. So we're getting very close to the human sense of fairness. And I think philosophers need to rethink their philosophy for a while. So let me summarize. I believe there's an evolved morality. I think morality is much more than what I've been talking about. But it would be impossible without these ingredients that we find in other primates, which are empathy and consolation, uh, pro-social tendencies, and reciprocity and a sense of fairness. And so we work on these particular issues to see if we can create a morality from the bottom up, so to speak, without necessarily God and religion involved, uh, and to see how we can get to an evolved morality. And I thank you for your attention. So I don't know if anyone happened to write morality down when they were thinking of what types of behavior could be, you know, distinctly human versus animal, because it might have even been that it didn't even occur to you that that animals could have a sense of morality. So, um, but there is some really interesting research, and you can actually continue to look up um, some of the, if you um, go to your lecture and you... Um, and you can see the slides and you can actually click on the YouTube and watch it again yourself and you can look up some of the other things that are associated with and there's actually more experiments that demonstrate some of the stuff that he was talking about how um, animals do have a sense of fairness and consolation and that these are some of the key building blocks of morality so now we'll move on to our next video many of you may remember Coco this is the gorilla, gorilla that they tried to teach language to. This is Coco was watching the movie Tea with Mussolini. Can you say acknowledge? Yeah. Coco's turning her back. This is a sad scene where Luca goes away and they all kiss him and kiss him and kiss him goodbye. Oh, honey, it is kind of a sad scene. And then they sing a song about courage. Or a three sided poem about courage. There they are kissing him goodbye. So, Coco, who's seen this movie, knows that it's a sad time. She can still hear everything, but she's turning away, so she does not okay. have to watch this particular part of the movie. Okay. They have courage, honey. Do you have courage? You have courage. You look very courageous. And she's Good. Signing. Good. Is there something I can do for you? <laughs> oh, honey, it's sad. I know it's a sad scene. Oh, and they're crying. They are crying on the movie. Oh, <coughs> honey, and there's trouble, bad, trouble, bad. Oh, sweetie, with the mother, yes, the sweet mother, the one who adopted him. She's so sweet. Well, I know, it's so hard to watch that, so you didn't want to. So here we have two very different um, clips that both illustrate some of the things that you wouldn't typically associate with animals. And Coco seems to have this really in-depth understanding of aspects of that movie, that she's, she's signing some of this stuff that's very social, this relationship, and she's communicating it to another human. She's communicating her thoughts and her emotions and her understanding. So this is some of the stuff that we can look into the behaviors of animals and in doing so try to actually better understand ourselves and importantly our own origins and the um, genes that we have in common the particular behaviors that we have in common will help us better understand our our brain and how we interact with our environment so these last two clips also illustrate um, very social elements 
and the, the social element, um, the relation uh, underlies it, sort of the brain and behavior relationship is really the foundation of culture. Culture is basically learned behaviors passed from one generation to the next through teaching and learning. So culture is something that we derive, we experience from others. It is not something that is in, innate. Our ability to maintain culture is innate, but culture is something that must be learned. We perform many tasks today that our brains were not originally selected for during evolution. Programming computers, designing apps, our smartphones. Yet, our brain is highly flexible. The things that the human brain did evolve to do contain the elements necessary for adapting more sophisticated skills. Acquisition of culture was a gradual step-by-step -step process with one achievement leading to another. And so the earlier foundations of our behavior, this gives us um, the ability to experience and maintain culture. And a lot of the things that you sort of see in um, science fiction movies about like, oh, the human culture, what is the human experience? This, you know, like uh, Planet of the Apes, you know, thousands of years in the future, the books that we write, this sort of higher order ability to assimilate our world and try to grasp it. This is sort of a, this also forms the foundation of why we can experience the culture that we do. And this is really related to how our brains have um, evolved to be highly flexible to adapt to our environment. So we'll be talking about these elements even more in um, the chapters to come. So this first chapter is really sort of to give you this overarching um, understanding or view of the brain and behavior relationship. And then the next chapter is actually we're going to be delving into some of the real foundations of that. The nervous system, the anatomy. So be prepared for pretty much an onslaught of some biology to uh, further understand the link between brain and behavior.